Hey Slavic Vikings and welcome to a video where I will introduce the two schools of international studies of realism and idealism. I will focus on the practical implications of these geopolitical theories, as well as delve into a philosophical aspect of human mentality and how it affects international competition or cooperation. First, I will introduce these terminologies and later give my personal perspective on what system is preferable. Realists believe that there are no universal principles with which all states may guide their actions. Instead, a state must always be aware of the actions of the states around it and must be a pragmatic approach to resolve problems as they arise. Realism believes that every country should try to expand its influence, but not to the point where it gets too strong and other countries team up on you. The term realism in international relations has been used since the ancient Greeks, but it's not until the 20th century that it emerged as a distinct school of thought. Realists such as Hans Morgenthau or Henry Kissinger argued that the international system is anarchic, meaning that there is no central authority to enforce rules or protect states. In this environment, states are motivated by self-interest, primarily by desire to survive and expand their power. I do agree with the underlining message that geopolitics is anarchic. Both schools of thought want to stop wars and the realists want to achieve this by the balance of power, which is a concept deeply rooted in realism and has been a long defining feature of European politics. It captures the constant interplay of power dynamics, alliances and rivalries among European states, each seeking to secure their own interests and prevent any single power from achieving dominance. This intricate dance of power has been shaped by the course of European history, leaving an indelible mark on the continent's political landscape. Throughout history, various treaties have emerged as tangible expressions of the balance of power, reflecting the prevailing power dynamics and the quest for stability in a dynamic region. These treaties often forged from the aftermath of wars or periods of great upheaval served to reconfigure alliances, establish boundaries and set limits on the ambitions of competing powers. The Treaty of Westphalia, signed in 1648, stands as a pivotal moment in European history, marking a turning point in the concept of the balance of power and its alignment with realist principles. This landmark agreement forged in the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War, a devastating conflict that ravaged the continent, brought about fundamental shifts in the political landscape of Europe. Prior to the treaty, the Holy Roman Empire, a sprawling and diverse entity with a complex structure of governance, held sway over much of Europe. However, the Thirty Years' War a protracted and destructive conflict fueled by religious and political tensions exposed the weaknesses of the empire and the need for a new order. The Treaty of Westphalia allowed recognition of state sovereignty, a cornerstone for the realist perspective, represented a significant departure from the centralized power structure of the Holy Roman Empire, it acknowledged the right of individual states to govern themselves, free from external interference and laid the foundation for the modern concept of the nation-state. The treaty also embodied the realist notion of the balance of power, by acknowledging the interests and aspirations of various European powers. It aimed to prevent any single state from gaining excessive dominance, thereby ensuring a degree of stability and security for all, at least for a small amount of time. Napoleon is criticized by both realists and idealists, by idealists for obvious reasons that will become clearer later, and by realists since he destabilized the balance of power in Europe. Therefore, after Napoleon lost, the Congress of Vienna once again tried to balance out the powers of Europe. Germany is probably the biggest victim of realism. Every time Germany tries to conquer Europe and fail, 
it got a bit smaller. As a poll, it hurts me to say this, but it is impressive how despite all these land concessions throughout the centuries, Germany is still the strongest power in Europe. The First Cold War is an interesting case of realism. This indirect conflict, often described as a silent war, highlighted the realist notion that states can pursue their interests through means other than direct military confrontation. In my video on nuclear bombs, I talk more about the power games of the US and the USSR. But one of the most prominent examples of power games during the Cold War was the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, a 13-day confrontation that brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. The crisis arose from when the Soviet Union secretly installed nuclear missiles in Cuba, just 90 miles off the coast of the United States. President John F. Kennedy responded by imposing a naval blockade around Cuba, demanding the removal of the missiles. The world held its breath as the two superpowers engaged in a tense standoff with which a threat of nuclear looming war was over the horizon. The crisis was ultimately resolved through a combination of diplomacy and back-channel negotiations. The Soviet Union agreed to withdraw its missiles from Cuba in exchange for the US to pledge not to invade Cuba and engage in a secret agreement to dismantle older American missiles in Turkey. The Cuban Missile Crisis served as a stark reminder for the dangers of nuclear brinksmanship and underscored the importance of maintaining a balance of power in the face of ideological conflict. It also heightened the need for effective communication and diplomacy in managing international crises. The Cold War era also witnessed numerous proxy wars, conflicts fought indirectly by the superpowers through support of opposing factions in various parts of the world. These proxy wars, such as the Korean War, Vietnam War, the Angolan Civil War, served as battlegrounds for the ideological struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union, with each side seeking to advance its interests and influence without direct military engagement. I personally believe that it is silly to assume that realism is a viable way to prevent wars. The latter examples of proxy wars are just a few examples of war and suffering being the direct consequence of realism thought. However, the Cold War is a fascinating period for geopolitics since it also kind of expanded the concept of idealism also referred to as liberalism sometimes. Before giving examples, let's define idealism. Reading straight from Wikipedia, and I quote, Idealism in the foreign policy context holds that a nation state should make its internal political philosophy the goal of its conduct and rhetoric in international affairs. For example, an idealist might believe that ending poverty at home should be coupled with tackling poverty abroad. So back to the paradox of how the Cold War expanded idealism despite being an inherently realist battle. NATO and the UN are both direct consequences of the Cold War, and yet they support cooperation among states. Despite the anterior motives of these organizations, it was the biggest step in humanity towards global idealism. Now on to my favorite creation caused by idealism, the European Union. The European Union, initially established as the European Coal and Steel Community in 1951, emerged as another embodiment of idealism during the Cold War. The EU gradually expanded its scope, encompassing economic integration, political cooperation, and promotion of human rights and democracy. The Cold War backdrop provided a sense of urgency to the European integration project, as nations sought to rebuild and unite in the face of a common threat. However, nowadays the EU ain't looking so good, with countries reinstating border controls despite the Schengen area promising free travel. The biggest issue, recently causing internal conflict within the EU, is the fact that the countries can't seem to agree on a coherent immigration policy, which is crucial if you want free movement, 
which the EU theoretically has. However, these new Western integration organizations were not our first try for global cooperation. Emerging from the ashes of World War I this time, the League of Nations marked a watershed moment for international relations, representing the first global organization dedicated to maintaining peace and fostering international cooperation, which is idealism. Conceived by US President Woodrow Wilson, the League embodied the idealist aspirations of the time, emphasizing collective security, diplomacy and the pursuit of shared values in a world scared of conflict with nationalism. The League of Nations obviously failed because of good old Hitler and Mussolini, but I would like to talk more about Woodrow Wilson who was so kind to play a pivotal role in the establishment of the League of Nations, but not enough for the US to be part of it. But anyway, moving on. Wilson's idealism was deeply rooted in his Christian faith and his belief in the inherent goodness of humanity. He believed that nations like individuals could be guided by moral principles and that cooperation and diplomacy could prevail over conflict of power politics. I disagree with the notion that idealism should be pursued on the basis that humans are inherently good and generous, because they clearly are not. My personal idealist philosophy is instead more based on practicality. I don't see the plausible impossibility of world unity as a viable argument against idealism. Even if such a union is impossible, I don't see any reason why you would not want to move in the direction of world peace, like many international organizations have successfully moved towards, like NATO or the UN. International cooperation is clearly possible, and it is clear that the best way to prevent conflict among nations is idealism, so I don't see any reason to not be an idealist other than the egotistical desire for your country to be more influential than others. This is no secret, by the way. Realism's primary belief is that every country should fight for its own interests. Moving back to Truman's idealism, despite my personal beliefs, I will try to fairly showcase the realist's arguments against his idealism. Realists argued that his vision was impractical and naive that it failed to account for the realities of power politics and the inherent self-interest of nations. They believed that the League of Nations, lacking the enforcement mechanisms to compel compliance and the ability to address the underlying causes of conflict, would be ineffective in preventing future wars. And in a way, the realists were right. It is important to note that idealism and realism transcends political spectrums. Idealism can be found both on the left and the right of the political spectrum. On the left, idealism may manifest in the form of social justice movements, environmentalism and pursuit of equality. On the right, idealism may express through conservative values, moral principles and the commitment to traditional institutions, much like with Truman. Same with realism. Conservatives may embrace realisms in terms of national security and the importance of military strength, and nationalism, obviously, while liberals may adopt realist perspectives on economic and foreign policy decisions. Realism likes to claim that it functions according to human nature. However, I believe that the most human thing about us is that we possess the ability to reflect and make decisions based on considerations beyond immediate survival instincts. And in practice, in society, we understand this. Most people accept or at least respect the rule of law. Rules in society can only exist if they are enforceable. And this is the biggest challenge of idealism. Countries don't really have rules that they have to follow. The UN has showcased how pathetic it is in its authority, really. Acting more as an ambulance than a police car. For example, the UN peacekeeping missions in Rwanda. They were deployed prior to the genocide to help implement the Arusha Accords. 
a peace agreement aimed at ending the conflict between the Hutu government and the Tutsi rebels. I talk more about this conflict in the Geopolitics of Africa video. However, as the genocide unfolded, the UN was slow to respond and the Security Council failed to provide the necessary resources and authorization to prevent the mass killings. Realism is definitely winning in modern geopolitics, despite idealism never being more popular in practice. It is truly pathetic how weak international organizations are nowadays. The three guiding principles of realism are Men are self-interested and power-seeking. Ideals are counterproductive in geopolitics and that man's natural state is anarchy. I have addressed the first principle earlier. It's true that people are self-interested and power-seeking, but we can overcome this like we do every day. The second principle says that ideals are counterproductive in geopolitics. Yes, it's counterproductive if you fail to recognize the existence of global trade and cooperation. Do you really think that Germany and other rich EU countries would invest millions of euros into Poland if it was geopolitically counterproductive? Germany recognizes that long term it will benefit from having a richer trading partner, not to mention the integrational reasons. I'm not really sure how the third principle of man's natural state is anarchy is different from the first one, so feel free to educate me in the comments. We should let realism die out. As long as realist mentality exists among us, there will be ongoing conflict and war. The US, in my opinion, is very realist. USA might have the most active role in idealist organizations like the UN or NATO, but in my opinion it just uses them to spread its influence and power. A realist global power like China or the US will always try to spread its influence, for example by starting wars in the Middle East, starting coups in unfriendly nations, debt trapping nations and many more actions that clearly are not productive for the well-being of humanity. I idealistically believe that the world will one day be united. By saying this, I don't necessarily mean one government ruling the world like in Luxley's Brave New World, a sort of federation would be enough. I just want humanity to recognize that it would be stronger if it united under a common goal. This goal could be eliminating poverty, space exploration, or uniting under a common enemy, like aliens. If aliens attacked us tomorrow, humanity would unite immediately. This video was inspired by Krotz, a critique of realism. He made an amazing video on this topic that is definitely much better than this one. And honestly, his videos are a huge inspiration for me since I really like the way he talks in his videos and as well as the topics he covers. There's a link in the description to the aforementioned video. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please consider commenting, liking and subscribing. And as always, favel, jegnam and goodbye.